little time at the beginning here uh, to tell you a bit about Desi Lid and the festival, how all this got started, um, etc. So uh, I'm a writer. I'm Marianne Monarch, I'm festival director. Welcome. I'm an English professor here at UIC. Um, when I first moved to, well, actually the last time I moved to Chicago, I was still in grad school. I was studying creative writing. Um, I came out here and I was feeling very isolated. I found this organization through uh, the recommendation of a friend who wrote poetry, um, Sapna Gupta, and she said, you should go check out SAPEC, which is the South Asian Progressive Action Collective. And they were a group of uh, mostly women uh, in their 20s and 30s who lived in the city and were involved in a, in a whole bunch of different things. Some of them were working on peace efforts in India and Pakistan, some were working on voter registration, some of them were involved with unionization efforts for the taxi drivers. Um, they had a lot of different projects, and some of them were really interested in the arts. So uh, I joined, made some great friends through that group, and at one point we started talking about um, wouldn't it be great if we had more South Asian writers in Chicago? And actually there, there were not very many. There was me, I had some books out at that point, um, Shauna Singh Baldwin lives in Milwaukee, um, and uh, she's written some wonderful books. And uh, that was kind of it <laughs> at that point. So, so we thought, well, well, maybe we could have a reading series. And we talked about having starting a reading series and bringing writers into the city to inspire oh, young writers and to, to bring a little of South Asian arts culture and if to it's the not community. Working, we can do it. Um, yeah. And. As we were talking about the whole project, it kept changing and shifting, and um, uh, some of us ended up deciding that it would be easiest if we actually formed an arts foundation to handle this. I realized that like, not everyone says, let's bring a writer into the city, and therefore we have to found an arts foundation, but apparently that's how it works. And so that's what we did, and it's uh, Daisy Lit is sort of modeled on the NEA as sort of a community support for artists and writers. So uh, we have actually now several chapters. There's a chapter in Toronto, Bay Area, LA, and the different chapters do different things depending on their interests. So, and, and it sort of wanes and waxes depending on the energy and interest of participants, right? So at different times, Toronto's had a reading series, the Bay Area had a writing workshop uh, that meant monthly. They also had, um, uh, they also brought in readers as well. Here in Chicago, uh, we've had um, the Critty Festival, which we've put on four times. We have had a writing workshop in the past, which we would love to get going on if there's enough interest. Um, the steadiest thing we've actually had is the book club, which we started 10 years ago and has met monthly. Uh, ever since, and we're going to have it in in very shortly and we invite two of the book club uh, organizers to come up and talk to you about that. So it's kind of amazing to me that <laughs> they've been going for 10 solid years um, reading South Asian books. It's great. So I wanted to, um, yeah, so, so we started the, with the Critty Festival, we decided to do a festival rather than just a reading series because we wanted to give the writers a chance to meet each other. Right? One of the things that is true about working in the arts, and especially in writing, is that it can be very isolating. A lot of your time is spent alone with your computer or your pen and paper in a room by yourself, and it can be very discouraging. Even once you've managed to write the work, you then have the whole publishing industry to deal with. Um, it's hard. And I personally find it's incredibly energizing to go to writer events go to readings, hear people read their work, sharing what they've been doing. It's inspiring. Often you'll go to something and you'll be like, oh, that sets off an idea. Even on the drive home yesterday, after hearing all of these people talk, I had an idea for like an essay about connectivity and distraction and, you know, it was sort of sparked by various things people had said. Will I actually write that essay? I don't know. But, um, but it, wouldn't have, it wouldn't have even been a possibility if I hadn't come to the festival. Right? So, um, so we really hope that when you come to this event that it is going to spark some of these connections. Perhaps you'll do some networking while you're here. You'll meet other readers, other writers, um, and, uh, and maybe you could 
perform some productive things. Sometimes anthologies come out of this sort of thing, um, or other group projects, collaborations. So I just encourage you to think along those lines and talk to people. And even if you are the newest of new writers, um, all of us were at one point, right? So um, just talk to people. Even if you're like, I'm thinking about writing someday, <laughs> you can still talk about it. So. Um, we did the Critique Festival first in uh, 2005, then in 2007, 2009, and in 2009 when we did it, I was seven months pregnant with my second child. Um, I had a two-year-old, uh, two-year-old at that point as well, and um, I needed a break. <laughs> so I found that small children are very time-consuming and energy draining. So it's been five years since the last festival, but now my kids are bigger, and I'm delighted to bring it back and. Hopefully that we can do this again. It's so great that you're all here. So um, I just have one sad announcement before we move on to the main program, which is that I'm not sure everyone heard that due to the fire out related to O'Hare, two of our panelists had their flights canceled repeatedly. They kept trying to make it out here, and they, finally they were like, we can get you out Sunday afternoon, and they said that's not helpful. So, um, so uh, Agent Anna Ghosh and Director Riddhi Sachdeva will not be able to join us. Um, if anyone was desperate to talk to one or the other, come let me know and maybe put you an email touch. So they've, they've kindly offered to talk to festival attendees. So, all right, so with that, I'm going to introduce two of the book club organizers who will talk about the book club and then introduce our guest of honor. So um, uh, Luana Hill and uh, Sital Shah are going to come up and talk about the book club. Thank you all. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I'm Sital Shah and this is Luana Hill. We are two of the three organizers. Um, our third organizer is Linda Grotzinger back there. Um, we help organize AC Lit Book Club, the Chicago chapter. We just wanted to speak a little bit about the book club and uh, invite you all to join. Luana is passing around a flyer with our uh, information and upcoming meetings for October and November, and on the back, you'll see a very extensive list of most of the books that we've read in the past 10 years. Um, AC Lit has been in existence since 2005. Uh, AC Lit Book Club has been in existence since 2005. We meet on a monthly basis to discuss uh, South Asian authors such as Salman Rushdie, Arunati Roy, Manil Suri, uh, Mithal Ghosh, Marianne Mohanraj, Anita Desai, Indu Sundaresan, Suketi Mata, and Mosin Hami, just to name a very few. Um, we're a multicultural, multi ethnic, multi age uh, group. We're very casual, so um, all are welcome to attend. Um, we meet at uh, the bookseller, it's a little independent bookstore and cafe that have been very kind to promote and support. They see Lit Book Club. It's located in Lincoln Square on the north side of Chicago. And um, if you see on the flyer, our upcoming uh, book that we'll be meeting to discuss is uh, called Salam Love. And it's a collection of short stories. It's edited by Aisha Matu and Noura Masnavi. Uh, we are very fortunate for our October meeting to have Noura Masnavi attend uh, the meeting. So I just encourage you all to attend. And if you have any questions, um, please feel free to see me or Luana or Linda after uh, this event. You can also find us uh, at daisylint.org and look under the local chapters and you'll find um, all the information about the Chicago Book Club and our past books. Also, you can go to Facebook and uh, type in daisylint Book Club Chicago, and uh, find us there and, and join our uh, Facebook page. So, um, as I said, you know, we're very casual. I, I don't want it to sound formal, but we would love to have new members, and um, anyone is welcome to attend. Please bring friends and anyone you'd like who might be interested and spread the word about um, the book club. Thanks. Um, 
Moving on, I'd like to introduce the guest of honor. Manil Suri was raised in Mumbai, India, and now lives in Silver Spring, Maryland. His first novel, The Death of Vishnu, published in 2001, won the Barnes & Noble Discover Prize, was a finalist for the Penn Faulkner, Kiriyama, and Penn Hemingway Awards, and on the long list for the Booker Prize. His second novel, The Age of Shiva, 2008 published, was listed as one of the best 25, as one of the best 25 books of the decade by the website Contemporary Literature on about.com. His third novel, The City of Davy, published in 2013, was a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award and won a Bisexual Book Award. The three novels from a trilogy based on the trinity of Hindu gods Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi, and correspond to the present, past, and imagined future of India. Suri was named by Time Magazine as a person to watch in 2000, and received a Penn Bingham Fellowship for Fiction in 2002, and a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2004. His fiction has been translated into 27 foreign languages, and has appeared in the New Yorker. In addition to his novels, he has written articles on South Asian LGBT issues for issues uh, for publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Times of India, and Granta. Suri holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Mumbai and a PhD from Carnegie Mellon University, both in mathematics. He is a professor of mathematics at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and has been involved in several mathematics outreach projects. His co-authored play, Mathematics and What It Means to be Human, will be performed at the joint mathematics meetings in San Antonio, Texas in January 2015. He is currently at work on a novel involving mathematics titled The Godfather of Numbers. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Manel Suri. you mentioned all the math stuff because there is going to be actual mathematics in today's talk. Uh, I decided I would try something new so I just wrote this talk for this uh, for this event and let me let me try to pull it up and see uh, see how it goes. Uh, so let's see if I can get this running. So uh, I want to start by um, showing you a map of India, and I want to point out that India is very different from uh, other countries. Uh, in fact, uh, look at this map. Does anyone recognize what this is? This is a map of what? England. Scotland. Very good. It's a map of Finland. And the reason I put it up there is because I think Finland is the exact opposite of India. Uh, I spent I spent like a few months there, and it was very uh, interesting. Where you know you'd be sitting at lunch, and you would ask a question like, uh, "What do Finns think about abortion rights, for instance?" And you know they'd all sort of secretly communicate with each other. But they would not say anything, and then one of them would be automatically chosen as the leader, and would and would tell you the whole country's opinion. So the entire country has one opinion. They're, they're all on the same page. And as we know, India is just exactly the opposite. Um, and, and that's great as a writer. Like if you're writing about India or if you're a fiction writer, I mean, we have like so many different issues and so many different opinions. And I just tried to list a whole bunch of them. Like, you know, just the, just the way we kind of, you know, it's, it's like people talk, talk about the US being the melting pot. Uh, and diversity in the U.S., but it's really India that has all the diversity. Like we regularly seem to discriminate against each other, and it becomes so it, it's so obvious that that's a part of life that you stop getting you know upset about it as much. 
So you know that people who speak a different language are going to hate you, and you know that people who have a different religion are going to be also, and you know, there's going to be differences in all these things. So there's class, there's caste, there's color, there's language, there's, there's a whole bunch of things that divides India. And yet India remains united, and there are theories about that, why this division actually causes, uh, you know, the fact that you belong to so many different groups means that your loyalties are never going to be in just one group. And so there's a great social movement to kind of split the country apart. You might figure that, okay, you know, you're, you're with these people, but then you're also with some other people. And that's what actually causes these great social movements to split the country apart, not to succeed. So there's actually unity in this division. Well, um, I'm going to list a few more things. And uh, these are, again, things that I think Finland you know, has a little bit lacking, like, uh, like uh, in terms of Bollywood, for instance. Uh, politics, too, like just the way the country thinks. Uh, I'm listing all these things not just as ways to differentiate India from Finland, but as ways that we as writers can really benefit. I mean, these are some of the issues that if you're writing about India, you can you really have a lot of meat there. You really have a lot of stuff that you can talk about. Uh, so uh, let me let me show you this this, uh, this this is one of my favorite pictures of India. This is Raghubir Singh, who passed away in the 90s. And uh, I really like this photograph because look at all the action going on. And I guess this is a guy selling mirrors, but, but I want to keep I want you to keep this image in your mind. Uh, as we go along in the talk, uh, this was uh, something that was that was said in his obituary uh, from the New York Times, and uh, it said that you know just his insistence on color, like Raghuvi Singh, was very much. I don't know how many of you have seen his photographs. How many of you are familiar with his work? And he's 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 quite amazing. But this was one of the things that 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 was talked about about him. Uh, and you know, okay, so. So this is a little westernized way of looking at it. You know, people might say, aha, India, exotic, colors, and so on. Uh, and I talked a little bit about that yesterday, but it's certainly an essential part. There's a lot of sensory stuff that goes into the Indian experience. So it does behoove the artist to bring that up. So there's nothing wrong with color. There's nothing wrong with these expressing these different uh, ingredients. But, but look at the second quote that, uh, that's there. And his second quote really talks about how, when you look at one of his pictures, there's always different centers of action and activity. Never just one thing that's going on. Uh, and that's very different, I think, between what constitutes Indian art and Indian literature as opposed to Western uh, mores. Uh, for instance, this idea that you don't have a primary focal point but your eye is always being trained to go in different directions. If you think about Indian fiction, that happens a lot. Like there isn't necessarily one straight arc, but there are all these side stories that are actually occurring. And that's actually part of the Indian experience. When you're in India, there's, there's a whole bunch of things happening. And that's, that's actually documented as an Asian kind of thing that we are actually trained to not just have one focal point, but to be aware of different things happening. Uh, and so, uh, this was another. This is this is something that that's part of his quote. That you know you have a very polytheistic country, a very diverse country, and you expect that many action is going to be happening at several different levels. It's going to be happening all around you. It's going to be happening at a macroscopic scale. It's going to be happening at a microscopic scale. So these are sort of the issues that confront you any time that you want to actually talk about India, any time you want to write about India, and I know many people here are doing that. And by India, I'm sort of, you know, it's not just India, but South, South Asia, basically. I mean, it's a similar kind of thing that happens in other places. Okay, so coming back to this picture, um, what I want to now mention a little bit is, uh, again, there's a lot of, uh, points here that are points of view in the sense that a lot of Western people when they go to India for the first time they talk about the chaos there. Like how many of you have heard that? You know, it's such a chaotic society and so on. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because as a mathematician I know a little bit about chaos. So I want to bring a, a few things to your attention. So when you think of chaos, you think about you know, all this 
stuff happening and there's randomness and there are mathematical ways of describing chaos. Uh, but what's also true is that in the last, I don't know, about you know, 40 years or so, mathematicians have found that chaos isn't as simple as you might think it is. It's not just complete randomness. There's actually more, more order to chaos than, than you might believe. And uh, there are ways of actually describing more about chaos using something called fractals. And what these things do is, uh, it's a mathematical tool for actually allowing you to see, allowing you to actually uh, analyze chaos and uh, actually represent it uh, in the sense that even in the most chaotic kind of phenomena, you can, if you look at it a certain way, there are orderly things that are happening. Like a lot of chaos can be generated by a very simple mathematical equation. And so, you know, you might say, hey, this is completely unpredictable, but then you go back to the equation and it's very simple. So fractals, which I will talk about a little bit, are, are actually a way of describing that. And the key thing about fractals that I want you to keep in mind is that they are self-repeating. And so uh, what I mean by that is, let, let's, let, you know, the slide keeps going on. So we'll come to the first slide. Uh, this is an example of a fractal. Look at the red area that was pointed out. That's the same red area blown up. And now that little bit is being blown up. And you'll see it's the same pattern. You know, when you take a little piece of it and blow it up, you get the same pattern repeating. So that's one of the key things about fractals. Take a whole messy picture, you look at one part, you blow it up, you see the same picture at a smaller scale. And you zoom into that, you see the same picture at an even smaller scale. And that keeps happening. Uh, and these fractals you will see all over in terms of nature. Uh, they've actually been used to describe clouds, the geometry of clouds. Like if you look at a cloud, you will see that the same kind of uh, structure is repeated at different scales. If you look at a coastline, you know, if you look at the map of North America from way back, you'll see that it's very zigzag. But then as you close in, you'll see that the zigzagging <coughs> occurs at more and more levels, at finer and finer levels. And so if you go down and really measure the sea where you are, you'll see that there's a little zigzag at that level too. So fractals are, now, now the difference between the mathematical fractal and these fractals is that these are much more random. So it's not quite as orderly as would come out of an equation, but there's still similarities in scale. Uh, you also, the, like the classic example of a fractal is a fern leaf, because you see that these things are like leaves, but when you zoom in, like each leaf has the same structure as the whole thing. And when you zoom into that, each one of these will have the same structure. So I want you to keep that self-similarity idea in your mind and think about things, think about this structure called a fractal. Uh, chaotic systems can be described by fractals. That's, that's sort of one of the essences that comes out of math. And what I propose is that India is essentially like one giant fractal. I mean, it's essentially there's action going on at different scales. You find that there's something happening macroscopically. And you find that the same kinds of effects might be seen in smaller scales. Whether you look at a city, or whether you go into the city and zoom in on a neighborhood, or whether you zoom in on that neighborhood and look at just one individual family, perhaps. And now this is not a new idea. Like uh, most fiction, if you think about it, when people are writing about you know, uh, a country, the way a country is moving, or the way a country is being transformed, they often make it, uh, they often represent that in the form of a very personal or, or localized story. Like you trace how certain family members perhaps are being swept through the tides of history. And that gives you an idea of the bigger picture. Uh, here in India, what we see is the same kind of effect that there are various stories going on uh, in, in, in each neighborhood, in each family, in villages. The villages make up you know, a bigger neighborhood. You see cities. And, and the country as a whole is also reflecting some of those actions and some of those movements that you see at the small level. Okay, okay, so, so now coming back to the story, 
Remember, I, I took a few of those things, like the most interesting ones, sex obviously has to be one of them. Uh, Bollywood, mythology, history, politics, and religion. I'm just taking these things. And so my idea is that essentially you're seeing similar stories, not the same story, but similar <laughs> stories that involve these, these different facets. And they're being repeated in different parts of the country. They're being repeated, and this, this picture I wasn't patient enough to draw a fat bill by making them small and all that. But think of these as some are shrunken, some are big, but they're being repeated all over. And you know, they're forming a kind of patchwork, a network, which is repeated at a bigger scale. And you might say, hey, as a fiction writer, am I supposed to grab all this, somehow represent all this? Well, no, as I said, uh, one of the nice things about fiction is that you only need to look at one story. And that actually represents something bigger for you. So it's a representation of, of the big story that you're trying to tell. And you do it from, you know, like a uh, human pr perspective. Something at a smaller scale is fine. But there is this idea of different scales. I want to take a little, uh, I'm the, I, 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 some, some of you have probably seen this before. But I want to take a little detour now. Again, looking at this idea of fiction some more. I want to take a detour to someone by the name of Vladimir Prop. Have people, anyone heard of him? Okay, so Vladimir Prop, uh, he did something in 1928 which is very interesting. He examined 100 different Russian folk tales. And he found that all 100 Russian folk tales, they all consisted of 31 plot ingredients. Not all these plot ingredients were present in every folk tale, but each one of them had them in the same order. And so if you activated seven of them, you got one tale. If you activated 20 of them, you got some other tale. But all of these had the same plot ingredients. And moreover, they had only seven different character types. So this was a kind of the first time that you really deconstructed literature into its components. Like what consists, what actually creates all of literature. So he was the first one to do that. Uh, and this is actually bringing some more math in. This is actually a mathematical idea where, for example, if you look at any wave, you can decompose it into very simple uh, wave forms. You've probably seen this. You've probably seen audio components where you see these little things going up and down. And essentially what they're doing is they're giving little signals which you combine together and you can actually construct symphonies out of them. So you know, it's this idea of deconstructing any large complicated work into its simplest components. And what I'm gonna be talking about is how these, you know, these plot components actually fit into my own work and, and fit into, in general, work about India. So I'm looking at these, which are sort of my functions that I've sort of chosen or that have chosen me, and how they kind of translate through these three novels that you've heard about, this trilogy that you've heard about. Uh, if you want to learn more about this, I have a whole uh, thing on YouTube called The Mathematics of Fiction, so you can tie together fiction and math, and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of talks more about this. So what was my kind of what, you know, remember I said different scales. Here I am, a mathematician, I decide to write about India. So where do I begin? Do I start looking at the whole country or what? Well, I grew up in Bombay. This is actually the picture from, my, uh, from our balcony. And you can see right away that there's a lot of structure, there's a lot of uh, interest. This is very old, this is very new. And they're actually, it's the same picture. Uh, you know, if you go from here to here, it's the same uh, view, just cut up into two pictures. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, place that I grew up. It's the flat that I grew up. And uh, we were actually something called paying guests. Has anyone heard that term? Mm -hmm. Okay, a few of you have. Uh, Mumbai, it was called Bombay back then, uh, is a very, you know, it's, it's a hugely crowded city and uh, it's impossible to really find accommodation in the center of the city. So what people do is they rent out rooms and that's, what, that's the arrangement that we had. So this was a giant flat and uh, this was our room. So we had a room here. Uh, this was the landlord. The landlord rented this entire flat and he lived in this room. His brother lived here and there was another tenant here and there was a kitchen right there which we shared with the landlord and there was
was a there were some bathrooms there and we shared with these three people. So it was a very and then there was one door and that was over here. So the one entrance. There were enormous fights about the doorbell and all that. But but this is actually quite common for the middle class in India. Now here's the interesting twist. Uh, everyone in this floor was Muslim and we were the only Hindus. So it was actually very interesting because that's sort of the reverse of what it is in India, where, where you know the Hindus are in majority and Muslims are in the minority. So, so that actually also was interesting, uh, an interesting part of the mix. Uh, here is here is a, a picture of our our little room, and you can see that it has a lot of stuff going on, chaos or whatever. But of course, there's all order in it. And what I'm trying to point out is that. This was my little scope that I looked at when I started looking at fiction, uh, looking at how all these five or six qualities, uh, the mythology, the, the religion and everything, worked in a story that was at a very small scale. The scale I was looking at was a single apartment building in Bombay. And that was going to somehow represent the story that was occurring at different levels, hopefully. You know, that was the intention. But well, there's the building, there's my little flat there, and how does this translate into a mirror of what's happening in the whole country, perhaps? That's the ambition. And so how did the religion come in? Well, what happened was I went back to India in 1995, or four, I forget. There was a man who used to live on the steps, and on the landing between the first and the ground floor. This is actually quite common in Bombay, and it still goes on, uh, where space is at such a premium that this man, whose name happened to be Vishnu, um, he was actually much better off than someone who might be just on the street. So when I went back, I think he, he, he would just kind of say hello to me when I was growing up, and he was a fixture there. He would bring stuff for the people in the apartment above us and below us. When I went there in 94, Vishnu was very sick, and he actually died while I was there. And the municipality came and took his body away, and I decided that when I came back, I was actually going to write a book about this, or write a story about it, which then became a book. But my original idea was to just uh, you know, write a short story, and I couldn't finish it. And uh, I was taking a writing workshop then, and the instructor said, hey, wait a minute. If, you're, if your title is The Death of Vishnu, it was supposed to be this story, then uh, you have to tie it with the god Vishnu. And I said, she said, you know, that's what people will be expecting. And I said, wait a minute, half the people in India are named after some god or the other. So why are you, why are you telling me to do this? And, but then when I started looking at it, I realized that there was a connection. This man was bringing stuff for people. He was kind of helping the building to go on. Just like Vishnu, the mythological Vishnu, actually helps the universe to go on. So that was a pretty nice connection. And so now, uh, I actually had, out of that list, I had several things already checked off if I went with the story. I had the uh, mythology in there, I had the religion with the Muslims and Hindus, there were gonna be several different religions living in this building. Uh, what else, there was, uh, there was gonna be some politics that, that came in as this story developed. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, there was, there was uh, Bollywood and uh, uh, it, what was interesting was that my Bollywood connection is that my father used to be in the music line. He was an assistant music director to Madan Mohan and then Lakshmi Kant Kerala. And so I always had this little Bollywood connection. But more interestingly, what was true was that while I was growing up, Bollywood was the common strand that connected all of society. So the way I was thinking of this building now was more like uh, a, a microcosm of the city and the country, and what strand connects all of it, and it is Bollywood. Like you could ask Vishnu who the uh, famous film stars were, he would know, as would the people living on higher floors who were you know, much more wealthy. Oh, this incidentally is uh, the, the UK cover. Uh, and of course, there is also the question about the most important question about sex, how does that figure in? And uh, the reason that figures in that this became, the more I read about Vishnu, the more I got into mythology, I realized that 
Uh, this building was also going to be a metaphor for uh, for reincarnation and sort of getting up beyond uh, earlier existences. And a lot of that ties in with uh, letting go of, of needs like you might have, like you know, working your way through the more base uh, sexual needs and so on, and then working up. So so that was a good excuse to have a lot of sexy scenes in it. So so there was that. Too. Okay, I see. Uh, uh, oh, and you know, so the book actually was released in 2001. It did very well, and uh, this uh, and I sort of got to live the Bollywood kind of. That's, that's, me, at the, uh, that's me at the uh, book release in the UK. They had it at some place called the Bollywood Park, and and this uh, this I was hoping for a uh, an actual uh, internet connection, but I don't have it. Me doing uh, a Helen dance in, in Brooklyn in 2008. Uh, so you just, just type in my name in Bollywood and it'll come up. And it'll see it. uh, where I did a full strip tease in the middle of Brooklyn. Uh, this was at a book festival and you were supposed to do something which you had never done before. So anyway, I took lessons for that. Okay, so what happened after the first book was my, uh, my agent asked me, hey, your publishers want to know. Uh, do you have any ideas for future books? And I said, wait a minute, you know, Vishnu is, is just one part of this trinity. There's also Shiva and there's Brahma, so why don't I write a trilogy? So I said, I'm going to write a trilogy. And then I thought about it and I said, the, the first book took five years to write. What have I just gotten myself into? So I called her up and said, oh, don't tell them about that trilogy part. And she said, oh, actually, I've already told them. And they love the idea. So whether, you, whether or not you like it, you are writing a trilogy. So I said, okay. Uh, so now I have to kind of think about some other book that would again, hopefully, uh, encompass all these all these items, all these functions that I felt my work was going to be uh, involving. And what would that story be? Well, I've already used up, you know, the idea of growing up and everything in this place. So. Uh, the next book, actually, what, what does a good author do once you've used up your own story? Well, what you do is you steal your parents' story. So that's what I did. Um, and so my parents had a very interesting uh, existence where they actually were married on July 10th, 1947. Now that's, uh, you know, that's, that's very close to August 15th, 1947, which is when uh, India became independent. And they were actually living in Rawalpindi, which is now part of Pakistan. And so what happened was that they didn't even get to uh, open their wedding presents. They had to just flee because all the Hindus were moving into India and the Muslims were moving there. So they actually made their way uh, as refugees. And this is actually my father's refugee card, um, where they actually came from Pakistan. They came to Delhi. And then my parents actually, most of the family remained in Delhi, but my parents actually went to Bombay. And uh, I figured, okay, this is going to be a great story, but when I started writing about it, it didn't really, there wasn't enough drama in it. Okay, so they couldn't open their wedding presents. Okay, that's about, you know, one paragraph. What else do you write? <laughs> so it gradually became something of a sort of backstory, a little bit of a backstory. Uh, and I decided I would write about this greater story that I wanted. Remember, I've done this microscopic level. I wanted to expand it to something larger. And so it became more the story of India after independence. Like, how do these same functions uh, come up in a story that is much more geographically diverse instead of just a building? It's now, you know, through Pakistan, through India. Much more historical because it became something about how India actually grew into a country. And the way I did that was, uh, it became a story of this central character, Mira, who makes this journey, and um, how she actually finds herself negotiating her way through a very male-dominated society. So it was her actually becoming mature as a female in this nation which was maturing as a nation around her. So that was the parallel that I uh, had in there. And in fact, in France, it was called Mother India. So that that that, that actually gave me uh, how to actually deal with some of the other issues. So there's politics, and there is uh, Bollywood, and so some of these elements naturally fit in. 
For example, uh, like you've often, uh, you've probably seen that uh, more right-wing political parties often represent India as a woman, as you know, uh, with a with a lion and everything. So it became also a story of how religion became more and more part of politics there in India. So that that's how it it, it really evolved. The mythological part also came in quite naturally because uh, this is actually a picture from the Elephanta Temple. How many of you have been there? So this is one of my favorite uh, things, and this is actually Shiva and Parvati. Now Shiva, uh, Vishnu is the active one. You know, he takes care of the whole uh, world and everything. Shiva is actually needed for the world to go on, but he often withdraws from the world. That's because he's an ascetic. And the problem is that without him, the world can't go on. So Vishnu is always trying to pull him back into the cycle of things. And so uh, Shiva is the ascetic. He's, he's also the he's also I mean he also has lots of affairs with with different incarnations of Devi. In this picture, what's happening is that the goddess Ganga is descending from from the top, and Parvati it knows that Ganga is going to be one of Shiva's uh, Shiva's uh, lovers, and so she's she's looking away. Look at her expression in this picture. She's she's kind of half smiling, but she knows what's going to happen. So she's she's not completely in the you know with with what's going to happen. That became the story, the backstory, the mythological link, uh, where this man who Mira is married to is a philanderer and he's often absent. And um, Mira actually, just like Parvati, one day she was always gone off. So Parvati goes into the forest and she takes her bath water and skin and makes a little baby boy out of that. And this baby boy is so wonderful that she forgets about Shiva. And she spends all of her time in his company, in this boy's company. And she invests all her happiness into him. And that's what happens with Mira too. She has a boy finally, and she just invests all her chances of happiness with him. Uh, there, is, there is also this uh, other tableau in Elephanta called Anthaka. Uh, and this is an Anthaka, but this is Shiva, and he has just impaled Anthaka. Anthaka was a blind offspring again of Shiva and Parvati, and what happens with Andaka is that he develops a crush on his mother, and he tries to have sex with Parvati. So this is this Oedipal kind of thing, which uh, which also worked its way into the story. Uh, so if you've read uh, The Age of Shiva, you'll, you'll see all these references. So anyway, that was book number two, and it sort of, again, managed to check all of those, all of those things. And I was faced with book number three, and the question was, who was it going to be? Like the traditional uh, trinity is Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. And that's actually Brahma who comes out of Vishnu's belly button, and uh, you know he, he ends up creating the world. So Brahma is the little uh, person on the lotus. And of course, the Devi, goddess, is someone who's worshipped a lot more than Brahma in India, but is not considered part of the traditional uh, trinity. Now, I should just mention something about this Trimurti. Uh, this Trimurti occurred in around the 7th or 8th century, something like that. It came much later. It wasn't part of original Hinduism. Original <laughs> Hinduism sort of had different branches to it. Like some people were Shiva worshippers, some people were Vishnu worshippers, some people were Devi worshippers. And uh, it's, it's something that Majumdar called synthetic Hinduism that occurred much later, where people tried to get all these strands together and make it one. So that's when you saw this Trimurti actually first emerge. So it's a, it's a man-made construct. So it's perfectly OK to uh, actually, uh, oops. Oops. Uh, okay. So so anyway, it turned out. What did I do? So here is here is actually something that I got um, off the web. This is a Trimurti from Cambodia, and this actually shows Devi and Vishnu and Shiva. So you see that uh, this this is Devi right here. It's the mother goddess. Um, you've also probably heard of the Jagannath shrine, which is also another uh, Trimurti, and that again has Devi with two male deities. So so the idea of Having a Trimurti with Devi is not so far out of the question. So anyway, in the Devi was the winner. 
Uh, and the reason for that was not just this, but also because this, this, this book was now becoming more about Mumbai too. It was the story about, you know, I've written about the past and the present, so now it was time to write about the imagined future. And so uh, Mumbai is often associated with Mumba Devi, who's the patron goddess, so it was natural to talk about Devi in this third book. And of course, the third book uh, really looked at the idea that there's this uh, confrontation between India and Pakistan, there's the threat of nuclear destruction, I talked about it yesterday in my reading. Uh, but Devi, of course, appears as Kali, so she is, you know, the embodiment of those possibilities. She is also uh, someone that the Bollywood connection, Jaisa Goshima, was a was a very popular film uh, in the 70s, which really changed the whole face of religion in India, where suddenly there were all these temples to this unknown goddess. So you can suddenly get onto the top 20 or the top 10 of, of religion in India. Uh, so this was also something that's worked into the book, and uh, I read a section out yesterday of something called Super Devi, who has suddenly taken over the country and created this surge, this resurgence in religious uh, uh, interest, and the right-wingers have tried to use that to rid the country of minorities, and that's what creates this tension that leads to a lot of the drama unfolding. Okay, so I'm going to go now, since we're running short on time, I'm going to go now to the best slide that I had yesterday. And uh, the third book, The City of Devi, uh, has three main characters. It's uh, Sarita, who's looking for her husband, Karun, who has disappeared. And there's Jazz, who's a gay Muslim character. And uh, what happens when Sarita goes through the city of Mumbai trying to find Karun. She's joined by Jazz. The city has been divided into Hindu and Muslim areas. Uh, there is this uh, Bollywood type super baby that has actually appeared in person somewhere, and you know, all these ingredients are there. Uh, what I mentioned yesterday was that I was trying to put this book together, and I was completely failing to do so, and the years were going by. And finally, uh, what, I, what happened was that I finally realized what the key ingredient was that was missing. <laughs> So, uh, so it's, it looks even better on this big screen. So, uh, so what I was, what, what this uh, kind of thing that occurred to me was that I had these three characters, Karun, Sarita, and Jazz, and I'd been writing this trilogy, uh, which, which were, which was going to have uh, Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi in it. And when I put these characters next to each other, next to their religious deities, I found that there was really some correspondence between them. Like, Devi is obviously the Sarita character, you know, the mother goddess. Uh, Karun is very much like Shiva. He sort of withdraws, he's, he's unsure about things and so on, so he's very meditative. And Jazz is very much like Vishnu. He's always in the action of things. And what I realized was I really had to bring these three characters together. And that's what actually made me finish this trilogy and actually helped tie it together as well. Uh, and it turned out there were several different threesomes that occur in this book. So uh, it, it, uh, it you know, all came together. I'm going to actually read you a, a key kind of paragraph, just a very short paragraph from The City of Devi, which, which I wrote, you know, even though it occurs in the beginning, I wrote it right towards the end, where I really was trying to figure out how to get all of these three things together. So let me read this little bit. Uh, and it's Karun actually talking about a theory that his father has, Paji has, about the Trimurti. Karun would elaborate on his father's own unique interpretation of the Trimurti, how Vishnu, with his sunny disposition, represented the, dyna the dynamism to make things work, while Shiva personified introspection, solitude, the tendency to withdraw from life which left the rest of nature's attributes for Devi to embody. Since she received the power to create, she was the most versatile. Bhaji said one of the three usually predominates in a person's personality. He'd see a child full of fun and frolic or mischievous like Krishna and tell its parents, you've got a lively little Vishnu there. Or call someone very dreamy, lost in his or her own little world, a real Shiva. According to his Bhaji, People went through the world searching for their compliments. 
a Shiva needs a Vishnu or Devi to pull him out of the shell so he can engage with the world. A Devi depends on a Shiva or Vishnu to provide her with seed, and poor Vishnu must constantly run after Shiva and Devi to ensure the universe keeps going. More than just pairing up though, the universe needs the union of all three. When Vishnu, Shiva, and Devi find each other, when they all coalesce as one, then and only then is the circuit of the universe complete, its true power unleashed. So that, that's the kind of uh, key, key kind of paragraph, which you know is one of those writerly things that you sneak in uh, and, and say to people, oh yeah, I thought of this like when I started the trilogy. Well, I didn't, it came to me right at the end. Uh, but the interesting thing was that when I went back with that paragraph and started looking at my other characters, they all kind of do have a predominance. They all kind of fit into one of these three. For example, in the first book, you know, Vishnu is obviously Vishnu, but then there's a character right at the top called Vinod Taneja, and he's a very reclusive character. He's withdrawn from life. He's obviously the Shiva character in that book. And then in the second book, the husband is very much like the Shiva character. The wife is the, the Devi character. And the son, his name is Ashvin, A-S-H-V-I-N. If you look at that, it's almost an anagram of Shiva, and it's almost an anagram of Vishnu too. So he's sort of in the middle, but at, then at the end, if you look at the last statement, it's, it's, he's, he's identified with the son, so he's really the Vishnu character. And so, you know, looking at that, I started finding patterns in all three of the books, uh, which, was, which was kind of interesting. But anyway, one thing I do want to clarify is that, okay, so I've identified, uh, okay, let's see, that's it. Uh, okay, so there's, there's a, I've identified uh, this, this, like Shiva and Vishnu, uh, the two characters representing them, uh, they basically have a relationship in the, in the book. And this is something that came up a lot after the book was released earlier this year, uh, when section 377, you know, it was, uh, reinstated in India, you saw these people in the press talking about Vishnu and Shiva and their union. Uh, what, what, what the myth is, is that, uh, so this is, uh, this is one of the other things in Elephanta, but I want to show you this. The myth is that Vishnu, uh, Shiva is once again withdrawing from, from life, and Vishnu dresses up, comes to, comes to uh, birth as Mohini. Uh, he basically appears as a woman. And then Shiva is completely in lust with Moini and in fact uh, has, has ejaculates onto the ground. And out of, that, out of that seed, they actually have a son together. So Moini, Vishnu and Shiva actually have a son together. So there, is, there, there are a whole bunch of these interesting kind of anecdotes. Uh, and of course, you know, the completion, Harihara, uh, is where Shiva and Vishnu actually fuse together. But these are not really sexual, uh, um, uh, myths, they're actually talking about something much more spiritual. And so that's the way that you have to interpret this, this uh, duality. Okay, so I guess uh, that's, that's the three books that are, that are actually uh, now fusing into one. And that's, that's what I call my Trimurthy Trilogy. Uh, but I'm going to show you one last bit, and that is, uh, that is this idea of how do you actually, you know, that, this, this took me about, well, let's see, 10, 17 years to do all of them. And now how do I actually try to make them fit into each other? Well, I think in some sense they already do in this, in this way that I described. But as a mathematician, I can't help think of, oh, hey, hey, is there any way to really put them together? So I want to talk about uh, what I call my connection problem. So this is, again, a mathematical kind of anecdote. So think of all these three books as some sort of storylines. You can often hear that word storyline. And uh, let's say that I wanted to write a fourth book. I'm not saying I want to, but let's say I, let's say I might as well even dream about this. I'm writing something else, but I keep thinking about this. So let's say I wanted to write a fourth book. And I wanted to connect these stories together. Well, if you wanted to connect these stories, you could probably do it by saying, okay, I don't know, uh, Mira in the second book was, you know, someone's mother in the first book or something like that. You could get something very contrived. Wouldn't quite, wouldn't quite be nice. Uh, in fact, if you have these three curves, let's say, let's say you think of these, instead of uh, open curves, let's say, let's say you think of each story as kind of complete by itself. You have three closed curves now. How do you actually connect them together? I mean, if you try connecting them by joint, by, by lines, 
that's going to be very kind of nasty here. You know, you're going to plunk down on this and it'll be very discontinuous and you won't really think it's a good connection. How do you do it? Yeah? Superimpose, sort of, sort of. Uh, and that's sort of the right idea. What you have to do is you have to break away from this two dimensional figure and think of these, think of a tube sort of going around and coming back into this plane. Okay, think of it in three dimensions. A wormhole. A wormhole, yeah. So if you had some story that actually went like this and you cut it by this plane, then those three sections would be, you know, they could be separate, they could be entirely different, or they could be some superstructure that joins them. So think of it that way. This is completely mathematical that I'm saying. That's what you would do. So what does it mean in terms of narr narratives? You know, what does that mean? Does this have an analog in narr narration? Okay, so, so what I think of is the following. When you, when you think of any story, or you think of a storyline, you as the reader are sort of looking down at the story, right? So there's some plane where their story is occurring, uh, and you as the reader are looking down. If you add a three-dimensional narrative space, then you as the reader would, would, would be again looking, looking from outside. Whoops, I think it's... I'm sorry. You know, this, this reminds me of uh, the, the thing about mathematical talks. Uh, they often say that, okay, the first 15 minutes, everyone in the audience should, should understand. Second 15 minutes, only, only the experts should understand. Third 15 minutes, only the author should understand. <laughs> and the last 15 minutes, only God should understand. <laughs> so, so this is a God part, okay? So, 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 so what, I, what, what my, I'll just cut to the case. What my idea is that, and I haven't worked out the kings, but here is Vishnu, Shiva, and, uh, and uh, Brahma, and there's Devi. Basically, these two are competing for the third spot in the Trinity. So they're going to have a battle of some sort. And uh, Vishnu and Shiva are going to be sort of the judges, perhaps. And uh, what's going to happen is that these three narratives are somehow going to be interpreted, at least parts of them are going to be interpreted in terms of Devi and Brahma, sort of interacting, maybe even having some sort of competition. But that's, the, you know, that's as far as I've gone. And the only thing I'm sure about, if I do write this, is what it's going to be called. Will have the perfect title for it? <laughs> okay, so let me stop there. Thank you. So happy to answer a few questions if we have some, if we have a little time. So, yes. I'm talking about the craft of writing. I think uh, the last novel, Sitya uh, Devi, you have uh, only two characters getting uh, the whole story. Right. Although there are three. And I like that idea very much and how two characters are pivoting against right. one character. So I, I mean, all three. Like the first, the first story, the Death of Vishnu, is sort of written in the third person. There's an omniscient narrator who's looking at everything and telling you everything. Second story, it's actually Mira talking in the second person to her son. That's how the second story is written. And this third story, the story you hear from uh, Sarita and Karun, and they alternate and tell their version of things. And uh, yeah, and Jazz. Yes, I'm sorry, not Karun. Jazz. And. Uh, it was, it was something that gradually developed over time, but the interesting thing was that if you notice, uh, their alternation gets faster and faster. And that actually helped me pick up the pace. You know, if you have long sections by Jazz, long sections of Sarita, and then towards the end, it started alternating very quickly, so as the action picks up. So that was, that was interesting. Same thing, some other But he, he, he only had one character. Yeah, right. yeah, sure. sure. Yeah. Yes, you have. Uh, I want to say, you were making me think of Miss Marple uh, when you, oh. you, you were talking about fractals, and this, um, I'm a big fan of uh, uh, Dr. Chrissy. And Miss Marple talks in one of the episodes and one of the novels, she says, uh, What happens in a village happens in the world because somebody right. asks her, you know, but yeah. you know, you sure. know, Right. So one, that and two, I don't know if you already know this, but um, uh, what I understand
understands that there's a reason why Brahma is also our worship. Yeah, yeah because, that doesn't. Uh, he misbehaved right. Saraswati. Saraswati, uh, right? so. So they, oh, there's already a conflict you can build. <laughs> actually, I have, actually, what happened with this book is I gave it up for, for, for about a year and I started writing this fourth book. And that was one of the things where Brahma is complaining about how he's been misunderstood that, you know, if there's only, if there's only, if everyone is supposed to come from Brahma, if he has created all people, then if he ever wants to, produce a child with anyone, it will be with his daughter, right? Just by, because they're, everyone is his daughter. So he's actually defending himself. So anyway, that, that's a good point. Thank you. Yes? It seems like in the last year, there's just a huge growth of trilogies, right? Um, and now it seems like people are writing the novels, people are doing the prequel um, after. I'm wondering, is this an algorithm that's being written by the publishing industry, or is this Oh, no, I don't think so. See, there's two different types. Like with my trilogy, publishing company did not want to hear that word. <laughs> because they said, okay, if you if you advertise it in this way, and when your third book comes out, then people who haven't read the first two won't, won't really want to read it, because they'll say they've missed it. So I think uh, there's a story that's complete yet, is by Tamima Amam. She's written two, and I'm really waiting for the third. And that is something that she's, that's the same story. She's a Bangladeshi writer. So that's something that I'm looking forward to quite eagerly. Other questions? Yes? So uh, in your uh, in your novels you have many, many references. You know, we don't know where we are. You need to explain we're in Bombay. You need to get all the Vishnu sections together and get all the other sections together and do this, edit this. And that's when I quit the writing group. Because, <laughs> you know, at some point you know explaining things, then it becomes a tome. It becomes like, you know, the, the, it becomes a non-fiction book. And the same thing happens with Indian history. In the second book, I did a lot of research about Indian history, and then I put a lot of stuff in, I have to take it all out. Because you cannot explain while you're going along. Now the one concession that was made was, in the uh, hardcover, we didn't actually have a uh, glossary, but in the paperbacks, we actually had a glossary in the back. So, question back there? Yes? Well, I think as a mathematician, one of the problems that arises is, uh, well, I'll tell you a couple of problems. The first problem that, that I became aware of was that when I first started writing, I had this idea, okay, in mathematics, you have a theorem, which is a very abstract statement, and what you do then is you can apply it to different variables, to different situations, and you get different truths that way. Well, I, for some reason, thought it would be a good idea to do the same thing with characters. So in my first short stories, I had characters which were really not fleshed out on purpose so that the reader themselves could put, put a, you know, fill in the characters the way they wanted and identify with perhaps someone they knew. And this idea of, uh, of, of abstraction in the sense of theorems and so on is a great thing in mathematics. It's a terrible thing in fiction. Because your characters have to be flesh and blood, things that the reader can actually grasp, grasp onto. It's just like in the story, if you're trying to write a story about a country, that's why people can get away with writing stories about just you know, a family or a village or something. That's something that we can grasp onto. And then we can extrapolate in our minds to something else. So that was, that was an issue. The other issue that I found is that uh, again, as mathematicians, you're, you're really trained to find the optimal solution. So you're never satisfied with you know, what might be second best, or you want to exhaust all possibilities before you write something down. So I'm always second guessing myself. And that's what actually creates a you know, much longer time period for me to actually write something. Or I'm just lazy, I don't know. But, but do you have a full time job? I have a full time job, so that's a great excuse. <laughs> what is your next book going to be about? So the next book.
Yeah, and it's a story, actually. It's not just you know math, but it's a story where the math is, where the whole creation of the universe is explained in terms of math. But there's an actual God rather than So you have to wait on all side years. <laughs> And she also wanted you all to know if anybody didn't get a program book, they are in the library still. Thank you.